The Accidental Entrepreneur is brought to you through our affiliate relationships with the following sponsors. Digital Accelerant, the digital mobile business card that generates leads. Text the word LAW to 21000 to get connected and learn how to get your own digital business card. And by Fetch Internet and Fetch Pro, the secure high-speed app that eliminates the need to pay for hotspots or use public unsecure Wi-Fi. And Printify, the online on-demand print shop for all your corporate merchandise. Be sure to visit our online store and get your own podcast merch. Listen to all of our sponsors' commercials later in this episode and follow their links in the show notes to learn more about their products and services. Think about you and your product that you're, I would say, probably nine times out of ten, you're going to be wrong to some extent. Yes. Right? You're going to be missing something. Okay. That's why it was so important for me to go meet with those distributors direct myself face to face, ask some very specific questions, but more than anything else, Mitch, be ready to listen and be quiet. So in that, with that case, you traveled, you had to go see the, or was it just local? No, I did. I traveled and, but it was really important because the things I learned, see, and, and also I had no predecessor in that role. So it was an opportunity for them to, for me to get to know them as our key customers. Yeah. And, and be very clear about what I would, you know, what my goals were and, you know, what I was asked to achieve. And in doing that, it helped establish my relationship, at least get that off the ground, you know, you know, well at the beginning. And I think the fact that I was willing to listen, to ask those, to ask the questions I did and to be willing to listen and really hear what they said and then act on it, I think was a very, very meaningful to yeah. them as well. As the information provided in these episodes is for entertainment purposes only. It is not a guarantee of success or to be construed as advice of any kind. You should always seek advice from local licensed professionals before making any decisions. The dictionary defines an entrepreneur as a person who organizes and manages any enterprise, especially a business, usually with considerable initiative and risk. People often start a business without much choice, perhaps due to a job loss or just being dissatisfied at work and they come up with an idea they just know can be successful. They become entrepreneurs by accident. That is to say their success or failure happens by accident, not with intention. My name is Mitch Beinhacker. I'm a corporate attorney and a business advisor. You're listening to The Accidental Entrepreneur, my podcast about how to achieve success on purpose, not by accident. Join me along with our monthly guests where we share our knowledge and help you get a hold of your business. And now on to today's episode. Just to remind you, the podcast is produced and brought to you by my legal practice, Beinhacker Law. We provide business and estate services to entrepreneurs, inventors, and other small business owners. Whether you're just getting started or you've been operating for a long time, contact us for all your general legal needs, from contracts to client agreements, from purchasing a new location to onboarding a new partner or key employee. We draft all types of agreements and handle most business transactions. For more information about our products and services, visit BeinhackerLaw.com or you can follow our link in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed today's interview. Hello, my name is Arnie Amir. I am the owner of Growth Point Business Consulting, and I work with my clients and enable them to plan, execute, and achieve the vision they have for the growth of their business. Okay, we are on the microphone. So, Arnie, thanks so much for. I know we had been talking about setting this up and and getting on to the podcast, but I appreciate you coming on because it supports me, it supports you, and it's it's like you said, it's like networking for two people, and we can just highlight your business over the next hour. But I'd like to first, you know, show the listeners your background because you and I both know we know we know a lot of people that work in your space. And everybody's got a little bit of a nuance, the kind of people they work with, their skills or whatever. And I think it's important to understand, you know, where you come from, your background, your upbringing, your, well, not like from a log cabin in Wisconsin, but, (laughs) you know, like, you know, what your training was and your experience and how you came to do what you do. Does that sound like a fair request? A great place to start. Okay. And th- and thank you for allowing me to do this. Oh, you're very welcome. Uh, you know, my background, uh, Mitch, is really 30 plus years of mostly leadership roles in in various industries. I do have 25 years in healthcare as, as part of that uh, part of that background. And with so like hospitals or a variety, Mitch, Just hospitals, things. offices, you know, managed care, you know, pretty varied with both uh, dev- uh, medical device companies, but also software, you know, more intangible products. Right, and a lot of that was administration. Or was business development or uh, sales leadership? Really good, really good, 
Yes, leading really good sales teams in the field, but also being on the corporate side as part of a senior management team. Okay, good. Well, that's important to know. So, okay, mm-hmm. so you were really driving the sales of the business. You were driving the teams to, you know, that's the lifeblood of any business, I guess. Yes, it is. And, you know, I, I was fortunate to get into leadership roles, you know, early on in my career. I found it, 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 was a, it was a good space for me. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And it also added to significantly to my experience and my expertise and prepared me well to do what I do today. And so what are some of the other industries that you've worked in? Uh, home health, hemodialysis, orthopedic rehab, among others, and a broad spectrum of healthcare industries, but also other industries like fire and security and nutritional products, things like, you know, areas like that. Okay. So you have a lot of corporate experience. So, so what, so that was how many years? You're a young guy, so it couldn't be that much, right? (laughs) Yeah. So 30 plus years. So you had a lot of experience. So what was the impetus for you to kind of say, okay, well, I can do this on a consulting basis for a lot of companies and a lot of business owners. You know, like many people, I'm a product of my experience. And that has, it. I learned early on that I knew at some point that I would do this and my experience my and everything that I've gone through in my career, I, I knew prepared me well to do this, particularly the leadership roles. I've had the, the, the good fortune to work uh, for some really good leaders, taught me many things about the value uh, of strong leadership in an organization and how meaningful that is and, and how, it, how impactful that is to any organization's success. Sure. So, so you kind of had a plan then you, I mean, you didn't just wake up one day said, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to do it on my own. You kind of had a little bit of foresight and saying, okay, well, this is my ultimate goal. As my career grows, I want to be out there doing it. Uh, Is that right? Yeah, it was, you know, it was always in my mind. And I I think I really did know that it is something that I would uh, wind up doing ultimately. You know, I, in many, in many ways, looking back, I wish I had done it a little sooner. Right. Uh, because it's something I really enjoy. Right. Uh, I, I love working with my clients. I enjoy helping them to to you know overcome their challenges, help them plan their success and execute uh, their plan. And it's it's the, the relationships I have are, are really meaningful to me. So so how did you? Well, first of all, what kind of industries are you working with now? In, in terms, of, it's all mostly healthcare, also, or uh, so it's varied. Healthcare, financial services, in-home services, also. You know, it's 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 been a, a mix of industries. And how did you get started? You remember? I mean, you had your plan, but so you have no clients. Do you go to your boss and say, "Hey, I'm going out on my own. Can you be my first client?" What do you do? <laughs> this is an entrepreneur show, so it's important we talk about that. It, it is. It is. It's. You're not far from uh, the truth. Actually, it was had been associated with uh, a company for a number of years, and you know, I at, at some point I said, you know, I I you know I really can do this now on my own. I'm I'm prepared. I've experienced enough. I know where my strengths are. I know how I, I know what I can do to help a business owner grow his business. And I just took the step in 2015. Okay. So, so then let's talk a little bit about, about what you do for people once your process. Because to say that you're a consultant or to say that you're a coach or to say is not really descriptive of what you do. I mean, your focus is on helping them be better leaders, right? And building leadership teams and so forth. So, how does Somebody listening to this says, oh, that's great. And they don't know what that is. So maybe you can be more descriptive about what it is you do for these people that you that are oh, clients. First of all, you know, my clients are business owners who have uh, to describe this in, in more detail. My clients are business owners who have launched and grown their business to a degree. Okay. And even reached a few milestones. Right. Very few of them are like startups, right? Brand new. Exactly. Some have been, but now, now the business is set and they're doing pretty well. But like any business owner, they still have challenges to overcome and goals that they would like to achieve. Miss, they're also working really hard on the day in and day out things that just have to get done because right. that's what keeps the business going. Sure. But what they may not be doing is taking that step back to look at the things they really need to do to enable the business to grow and achieve the goals that they set for themselves. Right. Typically, I take that step back with them. But part of that process is that I will t- dedicate the time to really get to know them as owners, as entrepreneurs, as risk takers. You know, what gets them up in the morning? What keeps them up at night? Right, what what are they comfortable doing? What are they not comfortable doing? And maybe sure. they have to do something that they're not comfortable with, but yeah. you then have to get them comfortable. And most importantly, you know, where are they today? And where would they like to be in their business? Where, you know, if they reach that, that first milestone, you know, they have a vision for much greater success down the road. How do right. they get there? 
Right. And those are the things that, that I you know, help my clients achieve. Yeah. Now, do you uh, think that a lot of business owners have trouble seeing the forest through the trees? You know, I mean, because like you said, they walk in and everything's a fire drill. Like there's 14 things on their desk. They had an idea. They had five things they were going to do. Forget it. That's over here now. I mean, is that one of the problems that these people face? It is. Okay. And one important aspect of that is really learning about them and, and why they are in that situation. What are they dealing with day in and day out? And those are the things that I need to find out in that initial consultation in the early stages of working with, with, with that client. Right. And the reason that's important, Mitch, is, look, I think we all know that we do business with people that we like, that we respect, and we trust. Right. And that's really where it begins. Uh, right. And that, that business owner really being willing to open up and share with me the challenges that he, that he faces every day. Right. And so it also uh, helps me understand where my help is needed, you know, where, where they're getting stuck in the mud, so to speak. Yeah. And what I can do, you know, to, to really help them overcome those challenges and make progress in their business. Right. Cause these kind of things, this is at a level where it's not cookie cutter, you know, you don't open a book and say, oh, I'm going to follow this system, which might be fine, but it's really, they've already developed the way they do things. And you've got to kind of fit your, your thoughts and processes into helping them develop what they already kind of started, sure. right? Absolutely. It, what, what happens, Mitch, is sometimes you, you get stuck in, in, what, in what got you to where you are and because you know it, it enabled your success so far. Right. But they also know in many cases that what got them to that point will not help them reach the next level. Very common, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And because and they're working really hard uh, just to get the, the things done that need to get done that day. Sure. And so helping them identify the missing pieces and what they uh, what they uh, the changes they need to make to enable their business to grow can be in any number of areas. But it starts with leadership. Always, yeah. Right. Okay, and asking the relevant questions about that, about their leadership skills, uh, and and how they and what they do in their business to to lead their employees is really key. And one of the ways I do that, Mitch, is to ask some relevant questions. Specifically, one is that you know if if I met with each of your employees and asked them what you are trying to achieve in your business, what would they tell me? Right, and would it be consistent even? Okay. And believe me when I tell you, you know, I, I don't always get an answer to that question because many business owners do not share that vision right. with their employees. Right. And the way I express it uh, to them is, you know, uh, your employees come in in the morning and they punch in, they do their work. And at the end of the day, they punch out and they go home. Right. But yeah, isn't it fundamentally better and more beneficial for your business if those employees were more engaged, they were more empowered they understood what you are trying to achieve in your business and the value that they have in helping you achieve that vision. It's hard to say no to that scenario. Right. Because it is it is hugely it is really impactful in an organization. Right. And the irony is that the cost of doing that is is very small. Right. It's just communication. Getting Isn't it fair to say that if you don't share your vision with your employees and know that they buy into your vision, right? It's a worthless vision. It's not a real vision. It's just a wish. You're just winging uh, it. You know? it's, it's what happens, bitch, is it's your personal wish. Right. Okay? But no one's buying into it and no one is going to feel as committed to it as you are. Right. Yeah. And they uh, never and, even thought about it, probably. Right. You know, their the employees are doing you know, performing a task and they may yeah. they may they may be doing it very well, but you know, they they don't understand the the direction of the company because it's never been shared with them. Yeah, I think I had a I was on a podcast last week as a guest and I a while ago I talked about this too about leadership. I was on some other show and I think that at that's where a lot of business owners at the levels that you're working and so forth they, they there's a difference between a a leader and a dictator. And I don't mean a dictator from an authoritarian government standpoint, but you know, somebody that leads versus somebody who just dictates things and say do this and do that. And first of all, it really reduces the quality of your life, I think. When you have all these people that are like can support you and you can empower them if you're not leading them down the path that help and getting their input because, you, you know, one, you can't be a one man man show. And I think a lot of business owners you and I hope you're going to share with me common problems and so forth. That's, you know, you grew up with a business and you got one person, right? So you told them what to do. And then you got two or three people and you told them what to do. And they were kind of following you. And now you're you got to make the transition. And we know a lot of countless 
studies of larger corporations where the, the founder, let's say, or the primary shareholder, outgrow, the company outgrows him. Like he can't get to the next level and they throw him out or something. Or maybe he comes back later or he becomes the chairman and he lets somebody else be the CEO. And I think that there's a lot of, uh, a lot lost in that gap, right? When it doesn't happen, especially if they don't meet you. Very, very much so. And, you know, that there's another uh, avenue to describe an example like this. And it's the kind of the flip side of the question I asked relative to employees. It's a question I, and it relates directly to leadership skills as well. And the question is, if I met with each of your top 10 clients or customers, what would they tell me about you, your, your products or services and the relationship that, that they have with you? What would they tell me? That's unfortunately that's a that's a step that many business owners simply do not take. Right. They don't ask their customers what they think, what they truly believe, and it's it's really a missing piece in in their decision making process regarding product development and business strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it just it relates to a specific experience of mine where I was in a situation where I was associated with a company that, that worked through a network of dis- that sold their products and services through a network of distributors. Okay. And those distributors accounted for about 75, 80 percent of, of the business. So, so they were really critical. Right. I was told that those distributors had had a strong history with our, with our company and the relationships were really sound. This is what the owners telling you this, not yes. the distributors. That's correct. Right. Okay. And my task in that with in, in that association was to re-energize the business and and and, and develop growth, but also position the company for sale. So I, my, the decision I made was to meet with those distributors myself, sure. ask some direct questions, and then just literally listen to what they say. And what I found were was that, you know, what I was told was, was certainly partially true, but I heard three things that were very specific. I learned that our products and services, uh, products uh, that our core products worked pretty well, but we were not technologically up to date, certainly not enough. Secondly, I learned in terms of being uh, able to do business with the company. Yeah, our distributors purchased our products. Right. Then they sold them to uh, their end users, right. their of customers, course. the end right. user. Okay. And when their customer had a problem with our product and they needed our help to fix it, we didn't get there fast enough, and we didn't we didn't resolve the problem fast enough. Got it. Okay. And third, and probably the most important thing I heard, Mitch, was that we our distributors felt that they really did not have a voice in the decisions that we made relative to product development and and business strategy. So I took a couple of steps. One is I was able to create some changes in how we do business with our distributors. Right. And that helped. But most importantly, I took an extra step because I felt it was needed to really ensure that we would keep our commitments, but our distributors would continue to promote our products, you know, very strongly. Right. So I created a customer advisory board, a distributor advisory board. I love advisory boards. It's so critical. Yes. And I I invited six uh, of those top distributors to become advisory board members. I, the qualifications were that they needed to understand what we do well, how we worked. We needed to know how they work, you know, thoroughly, and they needed to have a strong history with us. The I wrote a charter for the group to describe exactly how this how this advisory board would work, to and also to demonstrate how committed we are to make this work well. Right, sure, it definitely shows that. Okay. And we met twice a year in our headquarters, and where in some cases they met people that they had talked to but never met. Right. And each meeting would have uh, an agenda uh, that would be very specific, and everyone would have an objective to accomplish one, from one meeting to the next, and we held each other accountable. This way, our distributors now had a voice, an ongoing voice in the decisions we made, so that all their thoughts, their ideas, their needs would become, you know, would, would become part of the process. The end result was that the relationships were enhanced significantly and our business grew. Right. And that, you know, that's, that's something I can take with me to, to many clients because it's an avenue that isn't often taken. Right. Is it a common theme, a common problem that where the business owner says, oh, no, they, they love us. They think this about us. They, they think our products are this. And then you go and you find out and they don't, the message is totally being received differently than it's being given out. 
Yes, and part and part of that, the question that should be asked before you go out to those clients is that why do you believe that those relationships are sound? Right. Okay, because uh, that that's really critical. It's just in their uh, head. So, they just think it is. It's in the mindset of the of of the owner. Right. Is it there because well they are doing business with us, so it must be okay. Right. That I talk with, you know, I do, you know, maintain contact with those with those customers and, you know, it, everything seems OK, but that's not always the case. Right. So you really do need to get to talk with these customers directly face to face. I can say that. in a, I'm not sure how much I can say that right now. OK, but we can do it on Zoom. <laughs> right. Well, this is this is face to face as it gets. Again. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but this is look, 20 years ago, this would be very difficult now. You can communicate with people and see them and know them. You can't shake their hand, but you wouldn't shake them in person anyway right now that at That's least right. we have video conferencing, you know? And, you know, I think we've all learned to use to use Zoom and yeah. other the services tools. like this very well, you know, and you have to because it's, it's the reality. And I don't think virtual meetings will go away even after the pandemic. No. Well, I think it's become a very efficient way for us to use our time. I mean, you could now have an advisory board, right, with distributors throughout the country. You don't have to fly them in somewhere. That's right. You can meet on a quarterly basis. Everybody comes on the Zoom call. They all see each other. They connect with each other. You have all your links in, LinkedIn's and stuff, and you can stay in touch. I think, though, and this is a good lesson for people that are listening and entrepreneurs, don't take it for granted that you think you know what your clients, what your customers think about you and your product, that you're, I would say probably nine times out of 10, you're going to be wrong to some extent. Yes. Right? You're going to be missing something. Okay. That's why it was so important for me to go meet with those distributors direct myself face to face, ask some very specific questions, but more than anything else, Mitch, be ready to listen and be quiet. So in that, with that case, you traveled, you had to go see the, or was it just local? No, I did. I traveled. And, but it was really important because the things yeah. I learned, see, and, and also I had no predecessor in that role. So it was an opportunity for them to, for me to get to know them as our key customers. Yeah. And, and be very clear about what I would, you know, what my goals were and, you know, what I was asked to achieve. And in doing that, it helped establish my relationship, at least get that off the ground, you know, you know, well at the beginning. And I think the fact that I was willing to listen, to ask those, to ask the questions I did, and to be willing to listen and really hear what they said, and then act on it, I think was a very, very meaningful to yeah. them as well as me. So now you said that this company was one of the things you were charged with was getting it ready for sale. Was it eventually sold? The company? It's in. It's in. I believe it's in process. Okay. Was it sold to one of the distributors? Anybody in the system or someone no. else? Okay, but that's important because if I go to look at a company to buy it. And I find out that 70, 80% of your business comes from distributors. I want to know right away, well, what's your relationship? But they don't work for you. So yes. what's your relationship? Do they do business with other people? What do they think of you versus, you know, the no. other people they do business with? And those are really great questions. And there, there are many questions that can be asked, but the key is your willingness to listen and really hear what's being said to you and be willing to act on it. Yeah. So what are the other common problems or themes, let's call them, that you find that business owners do wrong, roadblocks they run into as, you know, as leaders of their, uh, let's use the word leader loosely. You're making them into leaders, but <laughs> as heads of their business, let's call it that. Let's as, use that Heads term. of their business. Right. Well, it, uh, you know, it falls into several areas, Mitch. You know, one is, you know, the owner I described initially, that's really working hard day in and day out, from morning to night, doing the things that need to get done that day. Right. That's, that's very common. It's the proverbial working in your business versus on your business. Right. And as cliche as that may be, it is, there's, there's a lot of truth to it. It's very right. common. Right. So, you know, getting them to understand that and willing to take the steps to 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 change, willing to take willing to take the steps that will impact change in their behavior, but also impact the organization. Right. So they're uh, not a slave to the business. It's killing. Correct. Them. You know, that's not why you really do this. Take all this risk. You know, it's ironic, but we really do it to have freedom in our life and have better quality of life. But and part of that, Mitch, is you know that they've gotten to where they are successfully. 
So they've taken some really good steps. Right, because that's how you start. You start working hard. If you don't work hard, you'll never get off the ground. Right. But now you're at 30,000 feet and you're still doing the same thing you were doing right. when you're down on the ground. Be- because that's what keeps your business going. Okay. But you know, that's that's why that's why it's so important to understand what they what their goals were when they launched their business and having them realize that what got them to where they are will not get them to whatever the next level is and, and, right. and their ultimate goals. Now, have you found that because we talk about you and I talk about this all the time, I'm a big proponent of business plans, strategic planning, all that kind of stuff. When you get involved with a lot of these, but do they have like a written, written business plan, even one they haven't looked at in a while, or a lot of them don't have them even? Most do of some kind. It may be detailed. It may not be. Right. But it does help me understand how they got to where they are. Right. It was the beginning of the story. But it also tells me what's missing. Right. It also tells me uh, where they need help. And a lot of that, you know, again, comes from really uh, understanding that business owner as a leader. Sure. Uh, and how that impacts the organization, because I think we both know that your leadership skills impact the, the entire organization in some way or another. Yeah. Uh, and understanding that aspect of, of the business is really is really critical. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think you know, a good business plan doesn't replace any of those things. It actually would tell you when it's time to like bring somebody like you in to help you get to the next level. I mean, that's really, you know, what it is. You got to, I think people have to be honest with themselves about what the, the what their skill set is. And if it's not to get to the next level as a, as a leader, then you either got to learn it or you got to hire somebody to work with you to help you get there or have someone else be the leader and you can just do whatever you're doing. And and part of that, Mitch, especially relative to to business growth, that owner may be, will will certainly um, say entrepreneur, that that will always be the case, but they may need to to hire that first salesperson or to expand it into a sales organization, some kind of sales team. Right. How you do that is really important because just hiring a salesperson with certain qualifications is is one is is obviously a, a valuable step. But the question becomes, how do you actually bring that person into the organization and give that that salesperson or any employee the best opportunity to succeed? Because, you know, I've said this in in, in meetings. I've, I've This has been part of an article that I've had published, you know, bring a salesperson into an organization and describing the product or service that he or she is selling and given that their goals and their marketing support and all that is is really important but indoctrinating that person into the organization into into the entire organization is really important because everyone in that organization contributes to you know the success of that product right and and, and that and that salesperson opportunity to sell it successfully so it's there's more there's more to it than just finding that salesperson well, you got to get them to buy in to be part of the team. Do you find that a lot of business owners have trouble with being, you know, doing all that stuff, like being the leader and sharing the vision and even working with you? I mean, it's it's a difficult thing for a lot of these people to, you know, they're kind of getting out of their skin, right? They've been doing this for 20 years a certain way. And now you're like, listen, you're not getting to the next level unless you change the way you do things. Is it, you found it in general difficult for a lot of these people? In, in many cases, yes. Okay. You know, but part of that, Mitch, is, is your relationship with them. Right. And, and all the things that you are, the, the, the time I dedicate to getting to know them upfront enables uh, me to really understand them at a higher level. It also enables them to open up more about what, what, what their skill sets uh, are. Right. You know, uh, what are they missing? What would they like to improve in themselves? Where do they really need the help? Right. And that that helps me understand what really needs to be done and where where I can help them. Many, if if they've never hired a salesperson, are not sure about how to, what you know how, how do I yeah, how do you do it right? <laughs> how do you, you know, what are you looking for in that salesperson? Right. Have you developed a candidate profile? So you can really identify what's meaningful to you and your organization so that they can have the best opportunity to succeed. And then once, uh, what's, what's the interview process to really identify the best possible person to, to recruit and hire? And then how do you indoctrinate? How do you bring that person into the organization in the best way possible? Right. Well, you really, you have to have a process, right? Because if you don't have a roadmap and a process and the person, just because they have a Rolodex and they're a salesperson and have 20 years experience doesn't mean they're going to be successful for you. Well, 
I refer to it as a new hire orientation process because it really it's, it's a top down approach that you know and, and that if it's done well, if it's done correctly, will give that person the best opportunity to succeed. Now, do you is that a lot of your work? So you're working with people to help them develop leadership skills and to help them build sales teams within their organizations to drive ultimate, you know, because that's obviously drives a lot of things. So much of that happens as a result of the work I do with that owner initially, because, you know, they, if, if their leadership skills are lacking in some ways, they would like to improve them because they know it'll impact the organization, you know, in a positive way. So in, yeah, in many cases, they are willing to take those steps and, and do some things differently that they, than, than they had before. Right. Well, they probably wouldn't even be considered working with you if they weren't willing to do it. Right. So, and that's more painful for you and them. So they got to be willing, of course. It, it is. And, you know, but in some cases I can do the work for them, depending on uh, what their priorities and what else they're engaged with on a day in and day out basis. So I can I can work with a client either on site or, or, or you know, as a, a plan or a consultation process. Do you find that there are certain common skills that are lacking with business owners? Because you and I both know that entrepreneurs, they're very right brain, right? Uh, I am too. We're all like that. We're very creative. You start out with an idea and you do, you work your tail off. It's a seven day a week, you know, becoming an entrepreneur is not a break. You work harder than you did for your company. That's with. for sure. So, right. So you're seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And the company starts getting up to that next level. What kind of skills do you see that a lot of these people are lacking? Because it, by the way, it is very difficult as a business owner to look at yourself and say, I, I have these shortcomings. I'm, you know. I'm sure that's difficult. So what, what kind of common things do you see that people are, are lacking? So people that are listening can say, oh, yeah, I'm missing that, you know, that skill. I have trouble with that type of thing. Well, some common denominators, Mitch, are, you know, there are many owners that are technically trained. Right. They may be in their particular and, industry, right? Absolutely. It can, it can be in, any, in many industries. Here's a word from our sponsors. Uplift your marketing and reinforce your brand with a digital business card from Digital Accelerant. Use a text marketing combination to stand out in front of your competition. Digital business cards make you memorable and most of all help you bring in new business through its warm lead generator. Motion graphics, intro, outro, and inspirational videos can be added during setup. Text the word LAW to 21000. That's L-A-W to 21000 to learn how to get your own digital business card. Suffering from slow internet speed? Worried about hackers? Fetch Pro gets the internet from your smartphone to your Windows and Mac computer without paying for a hotspot. Always get the fastest, most stable, and secure internet access on your computer with Fetch Pro. Follow their affiliate link on our website to learn more and get connected with Fetch. Printify is the online service that simplifies and automates the process of sourcing and creating print-on-demand products branded with your company logo, product, or service. Printify is a better alternative to pre-purchasing and warehousing your merchandise for distribution or sale. Follow their link from our website to learn how to set up your own online store. And be sure to visit our online store and get yourself some podcast merch. Follow the link in the show notes to learn more about all of our sponsors. And now back to our show. Right. But, you know, they, they do not bring to, the, to their business, you know, the, the knowledge of how to promote, how to market effectively, and, and certainly how to build a sales team. Right. And that's where they're going to need to help. They're, they're visionaries in terms of product development and the technical aspects of the business. Right, but their their leadership skills may not be quite as as developed as you know as other business owners, and you know their their ability to effectively manage people and create the environment, the, the culture internally, you know, maybe where I should be, where I can help them. Right, so they don't have to go off to a management school and learn all this stuff. They can hire you and continue to run their business. Yes, they can. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, and that's, that's a big part of what I look at in any situation, because whether it's, you know, whether it's managing a sales team or managing employees in house, how effectively you're able to do that has a, has a real strong impact on your, on your ability to grow your business. Right. And that's, that's an area that I look at pretty. Right. right. I find that there's a common problem as businesses grow and you can give me your opinion on it, but 
So the business starts out, he's got one admin person, right? An office manager, maybe a secretary. And then over time, he starts to, he or she starts developing an organization. So they have maybe some that handles the human resources, payroll type of stuff. Then you have somebody who's handling sales. And then these little silos start developing in the business. And because of the lack of leadership, there's no, and, you know, business owners who are in this position should think about this, but there's like no account for communication between these little silos, right? So the financial people aren't talking to the marketing people, the marketing people aren't talking to the HR people. They're using different systems that may not communicate properly and they're frustrated and they, you know, they would work much better together. You find that as a common problem? That is one common problem, yes. When I spoke before about the questions that I asked a business owner about right. what their employees would, would say, yeah, that's where you find out a lot about a lot of this. Uh, that it's not consistent these, from different, yeah. Right. But what you're looking to accomplish when you do that is to create a more cohesive workspace and a more an environment where people are really pulling in the same direction. Right. Okay. And you could, you know, I took the same approach with employees that I did with with the key distributors. You meet with it. I met with them individually in that in that company's case and asked the asked the questions that were specific to their roles, and but also what they knew about what the organization, what what the business owner was trying to achieve. And in doing that, you learn how how much they understand, but also how much they know about other parts of the company, and you know how and whether there's internal communication or whether there's where there are meetings that take place to to update you know employees about the progress being made, right? All those things become uh, really apparent, right? Because they don't feel me- empowered with anything that they're doing; they're just doing okay. whatever they do every day. You know, I, I'll give you another example uh, of something like that. Yeah, examples uh, are good. I like it. Yeah, I was engaged. It happened with, with actually just an attorney, okay. and oddly enough, this was an engagement that had very little to do with business growth. Okay. But it had to do with a with a, a workplace with about eight employees that was was not a really good cohesive you know workforce to say, right. to say they the weren't least. all on the same page. They were not all on the same page. Right. And the attorney knew that I think good for her that she really knew that she uh, that she did not have the leadership skills that she would like to have. So the engagement was probably to work with with that attorney, but also to learn as much as I can about what, what really goes on in that office. So what I, the steps I took, I, after being introduced to the employees, I, I got them all together in that first day. And I told them three things. I said, I told them that I needed to understand what happens from the moment a client gets accepted as, as a client to, to the time when that case is resolved, which can be, you know, two or three years. Right. Secondly, I, I told them I needed to understand the role each of you play in that process so that I can understand, you know, what your responsibilities. Right. And third, and this is probably the most important thing I could have said, Mitch, that day, I really need to understand what each of you think about being here, about your roles, about how things work, how, how they can be better, and what's really needed here to become more of an effective team. That opened a lot of doors for me in terms of communication with, with the employees and really understanding how it got to be that way and the steps that we could take to create a more cohesive work, workforce and to, to, get, to create an environment, an environment where employees are pulling in the same direction. Yeah, I always say that if you if you just imagine, what if all your employees were working with the same goal and everybody was communicating or all firing on all cylinders, got to improve your business and improve their quality of life. They're going to want to work harder for the business. They feel more empowered. They're, you know, it all makes sense. It's just, I think that it's just the way it develops. Like you had said before, right? You started out, you left your company, you started the business, you hired one person and it slowly developed and you were still the same person that was killing themselves running the business and you weren't paying attention to that kind of stuff. But I think, yeah, I mean, you basically allow them to work on the business versus in the business, right? Yes, absolutely, and and I think that's that's uh, getting them to see where those spots, where, uh, where those needs are, what they're, you know, what they can be doing, what what they would be able to spend their time on that would produce the results that they're looking for, and so and and Mitch, it's a gradual process. You don't have to create wholesale changes in how they do things immediately because in many cases they will resist that because right. to them that means that other important things are not getting done. Right. Okay, but. If you if you define the most critical areas, 
create those changes in, in, in internal processes, but also their, in that business owner's behavior and the things that they really pay attention to yeah. and the steps that they can take additionally each day become really meaningful because they will impact the company sooner and demonstrate to that owner that the steps they took really produced the results they're looking for. Yeah, I'm reading a book right now on Kaizen, the Japanese, I think it's Japanese or Asian or something, but it's it's the idea of doing s- small steps matter a lot more than wholesale large changes. Wholesale large changes generally cause disruption, right, yes. in an organization. Yes. You come in one day and all the computer systems are different and all the employers are like, I don't even know how to log in. But if you did things incrementally, they would all kind of move with that, with the pack, you know? And, and that's a great point, Mitch. It's, it is so true. And I can tell you, it's even more meaningful now in, the, in, in a pandemic because I, I do believe that there has been uh, a pretty uh, high level of frustration in many cases with business owners sure. because of things that they can't control. Right. It's been a big shift and we don't like big shifts. Yeah. Well, one of the, thing, one of the decisions I made in my own business and I'm encouraging my clients to do the same is to focus on what they can control and what they can still do now. Right. So, for example, you know, you can always promote yourself. You can always differentiate yourself. And they're important in, in any case. Right. But even more so now because those, those, are, those are steps you can take now. Right. And if you, if you decide on the steps that you can take on any given day, do one thing a day that is positive, yeah. that is meaningful, that can benefit your business, that creates a lot of momentum. Right. It's, it creates a yeah, lot of- You don't of, need to do 100 the first day. That's right. It's not going to work. But it's a, it's a building process. It creates a lot of momentum. It will carry your business, not just through the pandemic, but also beyond. Actually, you know who recommended this book? Nikki. You know Nikki again, Jemmy. I do. She. It, I'm in another group with her. And the name of the book is, for those people listening, it's called One Small... Wait, where is it? Yeah, One Small Step Can Change Your Life. And it's all about Kaizen, which is this whole belief. And I think I think Toyota was built on that process, on that on that concept, because they made changes to their to the whole manufacturing process of automobiles that made them, you know, top in the world. And sure. it's very interesting. And, and, you know, I think that thought, that idea applies yeah. to businesses in various stages. Sure. Uh, you know, I've advised uh, business owners who are, are in the process of launching their business to approach it that way. Yeah. Because yeah, like, like we said before, it can be starting a business is not easy. There are many things that you have that, that are really essential, but you can't right. do them all at once. No. OK, so if you if you take the approach, you know, that you can do, you know, one or two things a day that are really positive in addition to, you know, to other things that will move your business forward. Right. Your chance to be to succeed in your business are, are much greater. Yeah, I think I think that's the the secret. Right. If you look around, most businesses don't succeed because of some big innovative thing that they did. Right. Innovation is, you know, huge steps, big things. And even innovation that we probably use wasn't originally innovation. It was something that was overlooked. I think there was a story like like the mouse or something for the computer was invented by some other company. Maybe it was Hewlett Packard or Wang or whatever. They were going to throw it out. And they told the guys from Apple, that group, I think it was them, if I remember the movie right, that, hey, you want this? You want to go? And, you know, there you go. So little things that you don't realize, I think, like you said, you just kind of move your business forward and – it does come together as you as you gain momentum. Just trying to do some big, huge, great, wow, change in the world generally doesn't work. Well, and you know, Mitch, that's uh, that's actually a, a really good uh, point, uh, particularly about that's relative to business owners who have launched, who developed this this fantastic new product because they're engineers, right, uh, or they're te- you know they're technically trained people. And to their credit, they they did this and they right. created this product, and it's great. It, it's it's really innovative. It's it's totally updated, and it's it's a it has great potential. But are they good leaders? Right. Okay. Uh, or do they know how to how to build uh, an organization that will allow them to really achieve the vision they have for their business? That, yeah. That's where the challenges are in those in, in those examples. OK, so so what kind of advice do you have? So we, we you and I both know we network with a lot of people that probably aren't completely your customer profile. Maybe they're solopreneurs. Maybe they're just getting started. Not that they can't use your services. They all can for sure. But what kind of advice do you have for people that are 
either getting started or they're moving along, but they still have a small organization and, you know, things to watch for traps and, and things like that. I think it's really important to have, you know, a very specific goals in assuming that the business is off the ground. And, right. you know, Written money. goals down okay. that you can go back to, right? Right. And, you know, if, if you, if you have a plan, if you develop a plan to launch a business, make sure you follow it. If it was done well, it should be followed. But realize also that you'll have to go back to that plan and update it or revise right. it, you know, as you go. Be, be very specific about the goals that you're trying to achieve and how you, and how you get there. Right. If you're going to, if you're going to hire employees, make sure that you qualify, that you identify the profile that you really want in those employees and that you go through the right processes to, to find the right fit for your company. Right. Because it's not, it's not just a fit for the experience of actually selling that type of product, but also the fit into your organization, the kind right. of culture that you want to create. Right. And, and don't, don't be afraid to get help. That's for you sure. You can't do everything. The best yourself. people get help. The Absolutely. best people coach with people and work with okay. people like you. I, you know, I know a lot of people who are very successful. They have their businesses are doing very, very well, and many of them have coaches. Sure. Or have help. Have consultants. I know coaches that have coaches. <laughs> That's very true. They believe so much <laughs> in what they do, which they should, right? <laughs> they coach with. They coach with people. Yeah. 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 You know, Keep your eye on the prize. Keep your eye forward on what you're trying to achieve and, and the steps that you really need to take to get there. Remember that you're, in, in most cases, you do have competition. I so, hope so. If you don't have competition, you, you might worry that there's nobody <laughs> out there wants to buy your product. How do you define yourself? How do you promote, how do you promote and, and differentiate yourself versus your competitors? Right. You know, you, you need to be very nimble. You need to be very flexible and very specific about what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I think that's what and I think that's what people miss when it comes to like a business plan. Right. Over time, your business plan should become an employee manual as to how you hire, how you bring it on a separate manual about marketing, strategic planning, one about Mm -hmm. the financial aspects of the business and how to build it, one about management or, or maybe product development. You know what I mean? So at some point you might have a library of planning documents that you're going back to changing, discussing with people. Something comes up and now they know, wow, I need somebody like Arnie because, you know, I'm having trouble with this. But if they don't do the work and are, have their finger on the pulse, I mean, that's why sometimes you come in and you have to start over and talk to everybody and meet with everybody, and gather the data hasn't been gathered for you. And, and, and you're, you're, what you're expressing is absolutely right on. You, I really need to assess where they are right now, today, right, right. Uh, and how they got there. Uh, is, it, is, it where, is it where they want to be? Are they, are they where they want to be right now or are they not? Right. Uh, and their business, as I said before, their business may be up and running and it's doing well, but it's not the goals that they had going you know, when, they, when they launched the business. Right. Uh, and they they want to grow, but it's not happening to the extent that they that they would like. Right. The accidental entrepreneur. They're doing things not with intention and purpose. You know? Yeah. But I would think that even if they had done their planning and they got their books, that doesn't mean that it's correct. Now, you're the one person who has to assess. All right. Well, this, are, are you onboarding your employees the right way? Do they get it? You know, are your clients getting your message about your product or service, that type of stuff, right? The more questions I ask in those initial stages to learn what I need to learn about the business, the more I will help them identify all those areas. That's that's why the relationship development part is so key, so critical, right. and their their willingness to trust me that I will be as committed to achieving their goals as they are, and that I will actually enable them to execute and achieve that that you know, their plan. Okay, so this is an entrepreneur's podcast, and you're here because you work with business owners and entrepreneurs, but you're also an entrepreneur yourself, right? You started your own company, and you run your own company. So how do you develop your business, make your contacts, connections? How do you you meet people that you could potentially do business with? I network. You know, I, target, I, I network in a very targeted way. I've, I've learned through experience that if you network in groups, that have what I would refer to as good, high-quality people that that you can that you can help in, in, in a networking sense, but also get referrals from them. Because it, it, the reality is that it's not just those people, but it's who they know, who their connections are, of course. who their relationships are. Right. Okay. And it also, it's taught me 
I had to position myself in ways that will resonate with people and and enable me to to obtain the referrals that I need to grow my business. Sure. Well, I think that's good advice because I think you and I both know, and you run some groups that I attend. Some people need a lot of help when it comes to their elevator (laughs) pitch and being concise and getting their message across in a short period of time, not losing the whole room. Sure. Okay. And, you know, uh, uh, having my own group is is an effective way of gaining exposure. I'm also, I think, as you know, I'm a board member in my town's chamber of commerce. Right. Get definitely getting involved okay. in communities. Where I, I where I, I launched a speaker series in what in, in this town several years ago. That's not part of the West Orange Chamber. Yeah. I'm also a contract facilitator. Uh, for a peer advisory group organization that also positions me well to meet business owners, but okay. also work with them as a facilitator in a peer advisory group and also to offer coaching sessions in between meetings. Now, what, what organization is that? This is the Alternative Board. Oh, sure. I know Ted. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's a peer advisory group of business right. owners. A sounding who board, right? People get together, share ideas, mentor each other. Yeah, that type yeah of stuff. it's it, the whole, the the goal is to you, you need to be open. It's right. sharing your challenges and helping each other overcome those challenges and, and achieve your goals. Right. Uh, you're kind of your own advisory board, and I can tell you from from having done this that there is a spirit of collaboration and commitment to each other that that happens over a period of time, and it's really effective. Yeah. So did you did you approach them? Did they come to you and say, Arnie, listen, we have a board, we need a leader? Or did they come to you and say, Arnie, would you build a, a board and you had to build your own board? How did that work? It can it can happen both ways. I I worked for a, I did this for a franchise three years ago. Okay. Uh, They're a franchise, where, Tab? Yes. Okay. Okay. And I had the opportunity to take over a board, which was perfect for me. And I did that for a year. It was a great experience. Now I'm associated with a different franchise and currently in an effort to pull a board together. So you're a different franchisee, still with the alternative board. Co- correct. Very good. Well, people should check out the alternative board. I know it's a, it's a pretty it, uh, it's, quality organization. It is a high quality organization. It's really effective. You know, having, you know, peer, uh, uh, peer business owners committed that you're willing to, to help overcome their challenges and, right. they, and they for you is really effective. There really is, uh, over a period of time, it really does work. Yeah, well, you had mentioned before with your first example, and I told you I'm a big fan of advice. It's an advisory board is what it is for each other. And I think that a lot of people miss that opportunity as a tool to both network together, Mm -hmm. perhaps do business or help each other find business, to share ideas. The idea of an advisory board, whether it's through TAB or your own board, with people that you mentor with and invite and get advice from is I think one of the most invaluable, most valuable things you can do for your business. It is. And, you know, now that I've, I've experienced advisory boards in two different settings in, in two different situations. Right. So obviously I'm a fan. Yeah. And I think that that methodology, you know, that, that opportunity can exist for many business owners. Right. If they're willing to take that step and if they have a group of clients or customers that they're dependent on to grow their business. Yeah. And it makes, it makes, doesn't it make the relationship more sticky with your clients and with your distributors and with the people? That's what happened with that example that you gave, right? Because now the distributors were more, they, they were buying in, they were more committed, they were more involved with the company. It actually becomes a much more collaborative relationship because, you know, you're, you're meeting every six months. You are, you know, you're, you're, there's an, there's an agenda that you're following and it's all about you know, business opportunities for each of, in, in, in that case, each of those distributors. It's discussing the needs of their, their customers so right. that we understand them thoroughly. Sure. Uh, but what they're also in, they also have an open uh, forum to discuss what they need to sell to their, to their customers down the road. So it helps us. It helped us in terms of product development. It helped us in terms of business growth strategies. And look, you can't argue with results. The relationships were enhanced tremendously, as as was the trust in our business group. Right. I would uh, think if you choose the right people, it can't fail. You're only going to learn good things. Exactly. That, that's why I was very careful in the qualifications. Those distributors really needed to know us well and read right. them. Right. Uh, and they, they won't need, have a lot to add if they don't know you well. Right? And they needed yeah. to be willing to talk to express yeah, themselves. Of course, of course yeah. they got to be committed to doing it. Well, I think that's a great place to leave it. I think that's good advice because I've done pieces on advisory boards before. I, I just love the 
concept. It's the concept of two heads are better than one. And uh, people want to connect with you. I assume they can find you on LinkedIn, right? They can. On the web, yeah. any other place? Because we'll put it in the show notes to get in touch with you. What's the best way to reach you? I can, my, my LinkedIn page, my, my website, okay. uh, Growth Point Business Consulting. Okay. On my cell phone, 973-747-7387. Okay, no my email calls. address, okay. army at growthpointbc.com. Okay, we'll put all those links in the show notes. And I, I thank you for spending the time with me on the mic. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much, Mitch. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Arnie. If you like the podcast, please tell others about us. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, on Amazon Music, and many of the other podcast directories. If you like what you hear, please leave us a five-star review and feel free to share our episodes on social media. If you have any questions or comments, ideas for the show, or you'd even like to appear as a guest, reach out to us by email at info at beinhackerlaw.com. The Accidental Entrepreneur is hosted and produced by me, Mitch Beinhacker. If you'd like more information about my legal services, you can find me on social media or visit my website at beinhackerlaw.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe to our feed to be notified of all future episodes.